Good afternoon. Uh, you are listening to Expat Radio. I'm Bill Anderson and I'm coming live from, uh, I have to say, sunny Costa del Sol. We've not had so many sunny days just over the last uh, the last few days, but it's sunny today. And I'm delighted to have uh, my, my guest today, uh, Roy Steadle Humphreys. Roy, how are you? Hi, Bill. And good afternoon, everybody. This is Roy Steadle Humphreys speaking to you from distant from the distant hills East of Malaga in Andalusia. Yeah. Also sunny with temperatures reaching 20 degrees centigrade. I wish we had a little bit more rain for our mango trees, but I digress. Over to you, Bill. <laughs> Thank you, Roy. <laughs> yes, I'm coming from the Costa del Sol. You're coming from the mountains uh, around the Axarquia Algarrobo, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. N not far from Sailonga. Yes, there's a wonderful place names in this area, aren't there? Algorobo, Sayalonga, uh, which I guess must have Arabic roots. Yes, uh, Compita, um and so on. Yeah, there's another one. Uh, and Algorobo, of course, Yeah, from the Algorobo tree. Right, right. So, Roy, um, how, how long have you lived uh, over here in Spain? Oh, it's over 20 years. Right. Always in this area? Yes, indeed, yeah. Yeah. Always in this area. Well, we came out all... My, I'm, I'm, I'm stretching my mind back now to 19, um, 1990s. And, um, right. And uh, when, we, when we came out um, in a, in a beaten-up um, Range Rover... Right, and uh, and the, the um, I remember the springs were, were somewhat weak in the back, so with all their luggage and paraphernalia, the the car was at a strange backward angle, right. and we managed, yeah, we managed to get to to um, to Portsmouth, where we um, where we gained access to the um, ferry, Brittany ferries, and uh, and uh, so to Saint Ender, and we made that. Horrendous journey from San Andrea down to um, where we live now. Right. Okay. And you would need your Range Rover in those days to get up to the the, the mountains of Algarrobo, Absolutely, no? Absolutely, because um, um, because in those days the um, the uh, the road we have outside now was was just a um, an earthen road. It was more when after the rains of, of the winter, it was yeah. more like um, a, a riverbed. Yes. So you had to have a, a Range Rover or something similar. Yeah, that that was comforting. I, listen, I I know people who still live in these kind of places. Uh, when we were going to see some friends in in the the hills above Langharon, Granada province, and yeah. uh, he said, "You can follow me up." Then he stopped the car and he said, uh, "I think this is as far as your car will go." He was driving a a, a Range Rover or something, or a Land Rover. And yeah. he said, "I think we need the Land Rover for the last bit. <laughs> it would have ripped. It would have. <laughs> I think it would have ripped the exhaust pipe off a car." You know? <laughs> I think so. I could. I couldn't. Have, I couldn't have managed coming up the road as it was then in our present car. It would just be ruined. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, what, what what made you settle in in this area in particular, Roy? Uh, you, you know, because it, it's when you think about moving to Spain, this is not necessarily the first place that people would think of. No, um, I, I, um, I, we decided to um, move because we've been on holiday and um, um, we we used to have our holidays in Huancavelica, um, right? And uh, and the people who who own the hotel that we uh, we stayed in, the hotel Ankara. Um, um, the secretary then we became friendly with, and uh, uh, she had contacts, and we we we, loved, <laughs> we fell in love with Spain, right, right. And because um, um, I recently wanted, we, I have to say that um, I, I wanted to go to Greece one, uh, um, that particular year, right. And my wife said, look, I'll, um, I've spoken to the travel agent, and um, he said there's a there's a, there's a nice hotel in Puerto which I'd never heard of before. I had never been to Spain before. Right. And I said, well, I want to go to Greece. I want to go to Athens. I want to see all the history. I said, look, if you don't like Spain, if you don't like the hotel and Spain, we'll never go again. Well, okay. Just to just this once, just bear with me. <laughs> so, so we flew to Spain and we had two weeks here 
and the first I mean the f first couple of days I got bored and I, I got I hired a car and we ended up going to um, Sevilla um, Cordoba <laughs> and right. I started playing yeah. immediately and um, and immediately booked another ho um, another holiday the following year and um, and during that period um, we contacted the um, secretary and she had she had contacts um, along the coast near here right where I live now and uh, so we were shown and we, we we became very interested in buying land and um so they they showed us various plots and this and including this particular plot and we decided yes we'd buy this plot and uh, we we bought it we came back to the hotel and said what the hell did we do <laughs> <laughs> anyway and but, we, but, we managed to find the money we managed to find the money and uh, get the house built right right and uh, and and then we a few years later we 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 moved out, right. So Roy, but when um before you you moved here, um what what kind of work were you involved in? Presumably in the UK. Well, I was um I was involved in um, um magazines and newspapers. Lastly, newspapers. I was a, fr a freelance journalist. Right. Um, well, I was an editorial designer. Uh, lay, laying out the pages and uh, caption writing, right, and and, um, and photographer. Ah, right. Okay. And uh, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 it was about. I was doing a lot of freelance work, and and then suddenly, because I was getting a lot of work from the Daily Mirror, and um, and suddenly, um, Captain Bob f fell off his boat. Ah, right. Or whatever. <laughs> and uh, did he and jump the, or was he pushed? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And the bloom went up, and all, all of a sudden, um, uh, all the freelance work disappeared. Right. And, I, and we, we were stuck. We said, "Oh dear!" And that sort of more or less made our minds up. We we'd have to come out to Spain now instead of waiting. Right. So, okay. Yeah. So, so you 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 had your background in um in in the whole journalistic field because we oh, are yeah. we are going to be talking about your your writing, uh, yeah. and and but it's, it's nice to have some little bits of background, Roy. You know, to to know where people have come from. So, oh, you, oh. You, jun, journalism and and uh, as you say, that sort of laying out the papers and things. So that must have changed over the years, yeah. Oh yes, in those days, uh, it was um it was pads. With um, with um, carbon papers between the leaves, and uh, we used to draw on the pads and draw up the the the, uh, the titles uh, with the pictures of the ASCO and all that sort of thing. Right. And now it's all computers because you know it's Quark using Quark Express or whatever or, or something equivalent, and it just it's very much simpler. Yeah. So Roy, let, let, let's let's talk a little bit first about uh, first first of all about the the novels that you've written. Uh, you, you have published already three novels, haven't you? Yes. Yeah. And... Um, yes, three novels and um, and uh, and a, a book on castles. Yeah. Well, we're going to come uh, probably um, after the break. We're going to talk about the castles because I find I find this for me it, it's fascinating. I I love history, but um, you know. You, I, I was reading on your website that your your inspiration for starting on these novels and and they're set in the Norman era, aren't they? Yes, yes. That it, you you felt that somebody had been hard done by, didn't you? Yes, indeed. Um, that was um, that was Robert de Valem. Um, um, I I was. It wasn't as straightforward um, as as that. I. I was photographing um, car, uh, castles, uh, English and Welsh castles, and uh, for the uh, picture agency um, collections, picture um, picture library. Right. Okay. And and um, and when you're looking through the camera lens, you, you, you all of a sudden you're you're drawn to the details of what you're taking. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And um, and I noticed all these the chevron mouldings and these beautiful designs around the you know, and the typical normal arches and and I'm and I thought well who who built these who built these um who built these castles and um and you know it's it's it, 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 in fact 
the writing was unforeseen. I, I, okay. I didn't. I was not a writer. I, I had written captions for on the newspapers, but but the writing side of my uh, um, um, character had never had never really raised its head, and and I don't, didn't regard myself as a writer at all. But um, so. But it was in the mid '80s when I was photographing castles, as I said, castles in England and Wales. Um, I took took a keen interest in the architectural details of these fortresses. Right. I was struck with with amazement at the brilliance of those medieval builders, yeah. especially the craftsmen of the Norman period. Right. I was making note of the uh, the, the um, as I said, the, the creating the, these round, uh, rounded stone arches and entrances and windows, beautifully adorned with intricate chevron moldings, zigzag moldings, uh -huh. a circle disc with signs of the zodiac, all delicately carved with precision. And after thousands of years, the workings of those self same stonemasons and engineers are still visible sure. in all their intricate glory today and hold one in absolute awe. Yeah. Could, 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 can we put this into a time frame, Roy? Are we talking yeah. about the 11th century, round about then? Yes. Oh, absolutely. All about the, this is purely the 11th century. Right. Okay. But then but, the question arose, who built them? Right. Who, who, built these, who were these craftsmen? And of course, these are forgotten. These The names of these builders are, are long forgotten. And um, so, um, so my, my wife Linda and I, um, began searching for the answers in the British Library. In ah, London. right, okay. And it was here that I s discovered um, the names like Gandalf, the, the 11th century monk who became a bishop of Rochester, who designed probably, he also he constructed the Tower of London. Oh, right, right, right. And Colchester Castle, and probably influenced the design of Rochester Castle. Right. Then another um, 11th century engineer, called Durandus, um, uh, who master carpenter and builder. He was William the Conqueror's um, uh, designer, and he built the castle at Corf in Dorset. Right. And then I came, and then the name of Robert Bolem emerged, who became um, Lord of Bolem, and sometime after the death of his father, Roger Montgomery, he became the third Earl of Shrewsbury, okay. and who gained eminence during the reign of King Rufus, and was commander in chief of the Norman army, later become Seneschal to Duke Robert of the Second of Normandy. Right. Uh, Robert de, de, de Belem was also a military engineer who designed and built uh, Chateau de Gisors in Normandy's Vexine region in the northeast. Right. And, and who undoubtedly put his skills to work on the English castles of Arundel, Shrewsbury. Bridge North and Ticknell uh, and Tick Hill in Yorkshire, and I believe Canterbury in Kent. Right. Okay. And the more I read about him, the more intrigued I became about the Belém family. Um, Robert's mother, Mabil de Belém, a colourful character in her own right, was usually portrayed by the eleventh-century chroniclers as being a wicked, cruel, and, and a poisoner uh, of her right. enemies. Um, she sounds like I, a nice lady, yeah. <laughs> I, know, I, I thought this woman's character showed real potential for a great story. Right. And that's, and that's and that's what got me thinking about writing a novel. Uh -huh. So I began a long quest uh, into her life. But the deeper I researched into her life, the more indignant I became about the way in which medieval chroniclers, at least to my mind, had maligned, slandered the Belém family. And my question was, why? All right, okay, okay. What was more in infuriating was the way later historians so readily accepted this dubious received historical data with no certain way of knowing the truth. Sure. For example, um, um, Aldrich Vitalis, a 12th century chronicler, author of the um, not, uh, books, The Ecclesiastical History, accused the Belems of crimes against the church, of torture. And I have just mentioned in the case of Robert Belem's mother of cruelty and poisoning. But it has to be said that in this Mao-dominated period of time, 
the church did not like strong, independent, powerful women. <laughs> she was even more powerful than the late King Henry's daughter, Empress Matilda, who fought uh, the usurper King Stephen for the crown of England. Right. Women, because they thought that women should show a gentle and uh, softness of in nature and know their place. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and you know what, Roy? Some things haven't changed. There's still a lot. <laughs> there are still a lot of a lot of places. A lot of people who are not very well, keen on strong women. You know. So after careful examination, I was convinced that this was not a fair and balanced view. Yeah. But some sort. Of Concocting version of the truth, and 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 so, who, yeah. who who do you, who do you think drove this concocted version of the truth? What, what was it? The church itself? What, what was it? Um... Well, I think it? It was the mindset of that period. Um, I mean, um, I mean, um, because um, the church certainly didn't like, and people didn't like uh, Mabille de Belém. I mean, she was even um, she, she uh, um, um, fought against her enemies while right. Roger. Her husband Roger Montgomery was at court, going you know some miles away somewhere you know so doing business you know drinking and yeah. she she was on horseback right with with a helmet and and armor um uh, with a uh, with her troops at, attacking her enemies right. with <laughs> with young Robert would you believe young baby well, not baby in arms but he was still a small child sure. on her back oh. on her back in a, some sort of hammock. <laughs> So if you were charging with this, with a rapier, you know, swords and stuff, with a little Robert on her back. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So th th this, this kind of caught your attention. Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, this is, um, I mean, if, when you read that sort of stuff, you say, God, you know, it's a good story here. Yeah, but, but you know, I, I've I've written one historical novel um, as, as well, Roy, um, and... It's one thing having a story that captures you. It's another thing turning it into a novel, isn't it? Oh yes, it's um, it's a it's a um, it's hard work. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, I loved it. I mean, I couldn't. Uh, it became a drug. I, I couldn't stop. Right. I mean, once you once you got the um, the buzz, um, and you can't stop. You know, uh, you you forget about having lunch. You you forget t about time. You, you get so locked into what you're writing about. Yeah. That, um, you, you can easily um, forget what's going on around you. Yeah, it, it's when we had a conversation earlier this week, uh, you said that, you know, writing certainly in this style uh, is a very sort of antisocial uh, behaviour, isn't it? <laughs> oh, totally, yes. I mean, fortunately, um, at, when I was writing uh, for them, which took oh, uh, quite a number of years to... to to, to write, um, my wife was um, was um, was teaching, and right. so she was out of the house, and um, but she left me um, completely alone in the house, and I didn't. Um, so, so so that was okay. As long as there was a, there was a fire roaring away in the evening when when, when she came home, she that was, I think it was okay. Indeed, yeah, yeah. So you 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 made you found the story. And you yep. made the decision that you wanted to write about it. Yes. Um, yep. I mean, how much, even though you think you know about something, Roy, when you actually start to write about it, you find out all sorts of things that you don't know. Um, how much research did you have to do to to, to, to get Massive. the story together? I mean, for instance, um, the the, um, uh, the, uh, it, the ecclesiastical history of Audit Vitalis, which I mentioned, has six volumes. Right. Um, a lot of the information is in volume two. And then there's, of course, there's other, there's other works I uh, read, you know, um, 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 such as uh, David Douglas and uh, Frank Barlow and all kinds of... And, of course, when you... Because uh, at, the, at the British um, um, Library, I was picking up all kinds of um, um, papers written by scholars. And uh, so it was a... It was a the whole business, I think, took fifteen years in in total. You know, right, right. Uh, the research, the research, and the writing. Yeah. But do do you all, did you also find Roy that um, doing the research, um, e even though you know you came across something that that wasn't going to be 
part of your story. It was just kind of fascinating and you end up going off in tangents and following lines just because it's interesting. No, no, no. I was so focused. Ah. I, was, I was so focused. I just, all I wanted, to, I, wanted I just wanted to know about the Belém family and um, and what was going on around them. Right, and okay. That, you know, about what was going around in, in, in that part of Normandy. And, sure. Uh, Robert and, you know, um, of course, it also it, it, uh, you, you you read about um, um, about William the Conqueror because uh, it was all involved. I was I was involved with the writings involved with with that period, right? That character, um, King Henry the um, First, Duke Robert, and William Rufus. You know, so it was. It was um, so I, I was lo locked into that, and it was a huge amount of research. And of course, I didn't I I didn't go to university to, and study history so i had to start from ground zero yes yeah 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 i understand that um which maybe uh, that that was um 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 uh, that was an advantage maybe because uh -huh. um i didn't have any preconceived ideas right okay and so i just read and i oh, I, I i worked out my in my own mind what i think what was what was um, right and what, what was not okay. and uh, I, uh, um, uh, I'm based on my own judgment I, 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 I took a stand about that oh, uh, Norman the, after the Battle of Hastings when the Normans came over to England um, they were brutal they were nasty um, they were, um, so and Robert Belen was no wasn't any different um, sure. nor was his father but they were the conquerors, but um, but but I, I realised that when you start reading more and in in depth, you realise that um, Robert Belém was quite an interesting character, and um, and uh, he, he, he especially when he held court, right? Uh, um, he was. It seemed to me, you know, for that for that period, he was very reasonable. Sure. So yeah, so from from your reading, um, he seemed like a, a fairly balanced character. Or, yes, or, but but man. but from from the, the the accounts, well, not from the time, but from a bit after that time, um, they, they they seem to have painted a different picture of him. Oh yes, indeed, yeah, yeah. I think because a lot, most of the accounts were written in the time of King Henry the First. Right. Okay. And Robert Bolton, was um, his enemy. Ah, uh, okay. And, that, <laughs> and and the antagonism went back to their childhood. Yeah. Um. There's, um, and as a as a story where, um, I, Duke William, before he became king of England, Duke William was um, attacking some um, town in, in in Normandy, and he. Had, and before the uh, before the attack, they uh, camped in this particular village, and um, and so so the, uh, the uh, so so the boys, the William sons, were um, were, were held were uh, sleeping in one building, and the, William the Conqueror was in another building, and while while Robert the Belem and um, well, it wasn't called Robert Belem then; he was just Robert, Prince right. Robert, um, and, and 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 Duke Robert. Were were discussing with their friends about, about politics and so on. Young the, the young boys, these young boys, Henry and Rufus, are up in the balcony, and um, and um, Henry um, 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 goaded um, William Rufus to um, pee on 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 the <laughs> on the others down below. And so, so 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 Duke William. Went racing up the stairs and uh, dragged um, Henry down and started beating him. And right. of course, and of course, he was started screaming. And uh, um, and William came over and uh, and uh, um, instead of blaming um, the boy for peeing down on on his brothers, um, he he sort of um, he spoiled him and, and took him back to his quarters and uh, yeah. and. Of course, that and that very evening, the uh, Duke Robert and Robert Belém 
then decided to rebel and they were going to take um, um, one of the fortresses in Normandy right. and, uh, rebel against their rebel against William so 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 he was a, a little little oik right from day one <laughs> Henry. Is, is, is this where the expression peed on from a great height comes from yeah, do you think I, probably yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and of course Henry was I think was guilty of fratricide he's, right. he's, the, one who, he's the one who murdered um, I believe um, William Rufus in the New Forest right Right, we're going to take a short break um, for, for the um, um, advertisers. And when we come back, we're going to just finish off this conversation about your writing, because I've got one or two questions to ask you. And then we're going to talk about the castles, which I also find really fascinating. Dave, right. it's over to you. Welcome back. You are indeed listening to Expat Radio. I'm Bill Anderson. I'm coming live from the Costa del Sol with uh, my guest today, uh, Roy Steddle Humphreys who is in the mountains of the Axarquia in a, a little village, white village, called Algorobo. Welcome back, Roy. <laughs> Hi, Bill. Right, Roy, I, I have to ask you this. Uh, we've been talking about, um, you know, you being fascinated by, by the, the Norman story and, and, and perhaps the fake news that was published afterwards about some of the characters in it. <laughs> And, and um, but what what you have done is is to to weave this um, th this story with I guess as much factual historical information as possible into yeah, yeah. a fictional um, book because you're not writing a history book you you you, you are writing fiction. How yeah. how did you go about deciding on the language, the, the the narrative, the the way people would express themselves? How how did that go for you? Um. You can't, of course. You you can't talk. Um, you can't. Um, um, I think if, if anybody tried to talk the way they talk, you know, <laughs> in, in the English translation, of course, um, you'd laugh. It, 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 things are so diff so vastly different. It was like um, like another planet. Sure. Um, I just talk in ordinary ordinary terms. You know, as if um, a soldier. Soldiers to soldier, right? Like okay, army or something. And I based, um, for instance, I based um, Roger Montgomery on my father, I, I based um, um, Robert de Belém a bit on myself, I suppose. And right. um, and you know, you 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 see characters in you, you go in a restaurant, you observe absolutely, um, and, and you you make a note of um, certain way certain mannerisms of certain people and uh, you dot it down you see absolutely you know, yeah you come <laughs> and uh, watch it bill so i may i may be taking notes <laughs> on you <laughs> Well, I might be taking notes on you as well, Roy, because I've got a novel <laughs> to finish off. <laughs> so, so, but, but the actual, um, I, I, I sat down. I first of all, I, I worked out the whole history from from the from the birth of Robert de Belém to his death. Right. Okay. And and all the events and dates, and then then once I've worked that out. And I typed it all out. I then wrote the story around right. around those dates and uh, and um, situations. Yeah, but listen, we, 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 when we were talking uh, this week, uh, you said something, and actually, I can identify so well with it. Um, that you know, you've got this kind of dialogue thing going in your heads about who would say what to who, and you found yourself walking down the street to the supermarket, uh, t t talking to yourself, yes. <laughs> working out this dialogue. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't help, you can't help but doing it. You're doing it. So, so di I mean, people have said to me that um, writing dialogue is very difficult. Uh, I find it easy. Right. Okay. And um, um, why I find it easy is because maybe I, I, I talk to myself quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not surprising. I mean, I mean, nobody listens to me, so I might as well. Uh, you might not do it to yourself. That's right. Yeah. Well, as I did say to you, you know, nowadays people seem to be walking down the street talking to themselves anyway, and they've got a pair of earbuds in and they're actually on their of phone. Course. So if if you if you just stick a pair of earphones in and you can talk to yourself all you want, and people will think you're having a conversation on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but um, 
in the end, uh, I, um, in the end, I was finding writing easier. Right. Once you got into it, I mean, I, I, when I first started, I had no idea, and then I had so many rewrites, and, I, and, I, and then I would um, show my wife, and she would, she's, she's very, very good at editing. And right. We had many arguments about um, I, you can't use that word there, and then uh, and so I, it's I must have that word there. You know, I, I, I know it's breaking all the rules, but I've got to I've got to do it. Right. And yeah. Yeah. So that became so that's what I did there, but of course um, that was Berlin, and but when it came to the next book, uh, Nemesis, um, um, uh, in pursuit of justice. That was um, uh, she is um, Isabella. She is totally fictional. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so she is Robert Bellem's second wife. Right. Which is totally fictional. But um, I I wrote it um, um, a, a woman in mind uh, as a as a woman would write it. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I'll, you know I'll be saying to, saying to my wife you know how, how, what do you feel about this how would you do how would you go about, you know, describing this or doing this? You know, so uh, I, I wrote it as a woman. Ah, right, okay. And and and, and, and let's be honest, uh, Roy. You know, that there, there have been big Hollywood productions, uh, for example, Braveheart, that have built characters in that didn't exist at the same timeline, even as as the characters. So, <laughs> I, th I think you get away with that in a novel. And of course, the, then I then somebody's told me, uh, one of the characters in Belém was an uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, fictional character called Wolfknot. Right. Great and, name. Uh, and, um, and my daughter-in-law said, why don't you, well, I, I'd like to know about a bit more about him, you know, where did he come from? I know, what was his father, his whole history. Right. So that just started me on another novel, um, a, a prelude to Belém. Ah, uh, right. This, okay. This goes from 1030, 1035 up to up to the Battle of Hastings. Uh, and, right. and a lot of the words, um, some of the words in that book um, are, are in Old English. Right, yes. The towns, the um, rivers are, are, um, are, in, are, old, are in Old English. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and and I, I found that fascinating. So I, I was breaking new ground all the time with the Berlin book. I was breaking new ground because I've never written before. With the with the nemesis, I was I was writing as as a as as if I was a woman. A woman, yeah. And when and with the um, with the ne next book, the the Raven, the Lion, and the White Dragon, I wrote it as, um, um, in the not in the um, Saxon period, and um, and I was using um, all kinds of uh, um, uh, um, Saxon words, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, and but but uh, this is fascinating uh, in itself, Roy. But... Which was rather interesting because doing that it gave me the because um, a lot of the English towns, the the, the names, the spelling is is somewhat weird. Uh -huh. um, and, and once you've gone into the Anglo-Saxon names of those same towns, you realise ah, that's where that comes that's from. That's where it comes from, exactly. You, yeah. But the, but the beauty of it all is, is that it helped me to understand my own country, my own history. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And where we came from. Yeah. OK, well, Roy, one, one final question. Um, I, and I understand exactly where you're coming from when you said that you probably based the Belém character on yourself. Did you actually feel that you identified with him in some way? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, um, I mean... When I wrote his uh, death, I mean that was uh, um, um, I was mortified. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I got very emotional. <laughs> yeah, a, a bit like writing your own obituary, then, Roy. Yeah. Yes, really it was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. L listen, we, we could talk about about this. I, I I just find the whole subject of writing so fascinating, and the fact that you just decided after all the research and just to get on and do it. But I, I, I really want to pick up on some of this stuff with the castles right. um, be, because, um, you know, England, Scotland, well, actually, I, I, I guess France and Germany are, are just littered with castles. Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, I mean, even places that you think, you know, that there's only half a dozen people and two dogs and a pig and a donkey live here. And there was a castle in it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, wh wh when did castle building take over from the sort of hill fort type of um, uh, fortifications? Do you know? Well, in England, uh, in, certainly in England, um, there was a, um, a fort. And these were a lot of these forts were pre um, were prefabricated. All right, and um, and um, and so in order to subdue the, in order for William to subdue the country of England, right, he had, he had to have all these castles, and these were forts. Every um, there were about there was there were hundreds of them. Sure. Um, uh, every fifty miles, so that if one fort was um, being attacked, um, they sent up a smoke signal, and the um, and troops from the nearest fort would come to their aid. Right. And um, and, and because I mean, when he, soon after he, he, he won the Battle of Hastings, he, he, England was in turmoil, and there was it wasn't easy. And um, and of course, you know, two years later, what, ten sixty seven, I think it was, or no, sixty nine, um, there was the harrying of the North, where the Northern people, the Northern Earls, rebelled against William. Right. Okay. Uh, and um, and William went north, and um, and it was the first recorded um, uh, mass murder of a of of, of an of an entire area of of, of England or, right. or any country. It, um, and um, 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 audit Pitalis said um, over a hundred thousand souls were, were were put to death. Right. Now, so, in today's terms, that would be millions. Yeah, that, sure, sure. That but, was the whole of Yorkshire, um, which we now call Yorkshire, Lancashire, right up to the Scottish border. Right. And, and Roy, to, to, to what extent were, were these castles um, functional places and to what extent were they just signs of wealth and power and opulence? And, uh, well, that came in, well, that came in during... Um, um, Henry the Second's time, really, the the stone castles. They were they were they were gradually uh, converting these wooden castles into stone. Oh, but right. By by um, by the twelfth century, um, in the time of Henry the Second, um, you know, you got you got places like um, Arundel, because um, um, originally Arundel was a wooden was a wooden fort. All oh, right. But, okay. I mean, um, and Robert Belem, who who all took that over from his father, he he started to build a shell keep, um, um, you know, stone keep. Right. Um, then we got, to, but the only stone buildings of the of, of that of the early period was 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 Colchester, um, Rochester, and um, and um, um, let me see now, Poppy Canterbury. And and um, and um, I can't think where else. Uh, but the, they were but exceptional. But it, it wasn't until the, um, the late um, uh, it was eleven in the twelfth century in, during Henry the Second's time that the, the castle building came to its own and yeah. um, and they, like Corf, uh, like um, uh, Dover Castle, for instance, right. as this magnificent keep there. Um, um, that was um, a guy called Wolverstone built that. Yeah. And, and uh, so, but when when you're talking about the builders, you're not talking about the lords or whatever that had them. No, you're talking no. about the people who physically yeah. des designed and had these places built. Absolutely. Right. Um, uh, it was a small. It was a it's nucleus of um, of of, of um, stonemasons. Um, uh, they were. Usually, um, they usually owned a stone quarry, right? And um, and they and it was very much um, um, this mathematics came into it. So you know, there the very few stonemasons knew the, this um, secret um, stuff of you know mathematics, and they right. and, and understood how to split stone and and, and and so on. Yeah, and and these were very clever people indeed. Yeah. I, and, and you know, when you think about, uh, you know, I, I look around where we live and, and there's a lot of building going going on here. And, uh, you know, when I think about the the 
the magnificent um, architecture and uh, work that has gone into castles and look at these boxes that we we, we now call houses <laughs> it's like yeah. uh, it, it's really quite hard to, to, to think of these two things as being the same principle isn't it yes yes indeed um, I, I'm, for instance um, I, I, I mean uh, Durham Durham Castle was a, uh, I, I believe a um, um, a Wolverston uh, was built by Richard de Wolverston, um, and uh, they and they were paid quite well, mm -hmm. and uh, absolutely, and uh, um, they were given um, a fur cloak, two two cloaks a year, right? <laughs> yeah, and uh, and they were, and they were the engine. Well, they were called engineers. Um, not architects. They were called engineers. You go. You went from. You went from. Um, if it was in. If it usually went. In, in, uh, you. It was kept in families, basically. Right. And, um, uh, uh, and uh, what, the stonemason became uh, eventually. If he was good, it became an engineer. Ah, uh, right. Okay. And, they were the, and they're today's architects. And and what would these people have been paid in apart from cloaks? Would it would they have been paid in gold? Would they have been pay, pay, paid in, in land or how do you know how they would have some been of, paid? Some were paid in land. Um and some were paid I've got a I've got a um but it's very difficult to find exactly how much um um they, they were paid um, I mean, also the money was so different in those days. Right. I mean, the English, the English mark, because it wasn't pound. The English mark after ten sixty six was worth one hundred and sixty pence, or thirteen shillings and four pence, or two thirds of a pound in sterling. Right. Uh, but it's difficult to um, say how much that was worth today. Yeah, but, but I mean, if you take inflation into account, I mean, it could have been a fortune, couldn't it? Indeed, indeed, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and Roy, do you have, and I'm going to ask you the hard question, do you do you have a favourite castle, a castle that when, when you started to look into it or you started to photograph it, it just kind of captured your attention and, and, you, and, and you thought, you know, this is it? Oh, there's many. many. Uh, there's um, Scarborough Castle, which I... Which is not much of it left now because it was um, destroyed during the Civil War. Right. Um, but that was an amazing looking castle. Um, Dover Castle, of course. Right. Um, but these, uh, and of course, also Rochester Castle, which is one of the early castles. Um, um, it, I think its early design was by um, the Bishop, um, the Bishop of Rochester. Okay. Uh, Gandalf, but um, that was an interesting castle. But um, unfortunately, I mean, I, I would, um, if, if I was in charge, I, I would put some of these castles back into working condition, and uh, and uh, so you can see how these castles functioned. But of course, a lot of these castles are owned by English heritage, and uh, right. they, they, they just they just won't let they won't do anything to these castles other than maintain them as they are without. I mean, I would, I, I would, um, or some sections of them, I would, I would not rebuild, but I would put them back into new condition again. You know, just that, that part of the castle. So you have a, a better idea on how the um, castles functioned and how they how they looked in those days. Yeah, there, there, there have been some examples of this in 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 Scotland. I know, um, uh, for example, Stirling Castle. They recreated the Great Hall, uh, as as they believed it to have been in its heyday, uh, and and it is it is quite impressive. You know, it, it it is a wonderful thing to 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 experience. I mean, one of the most um, um it's not the castle itself, but with um with Porchester Castle, for instance. Mm. Um, um, there's a church in the grounds, okay. which, is of the same, which is of the same Norman period, and the details around the um, around the um, 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 the entrance sure. are amazing. Yeah, Absolutely amazing. Uh, I mean, you, I, I was um, I, I stood there in, in amazement, looking at these the details of the carving. And right, thought, these were these were 
and this is after a thousand it's a years. A thousand years on, uh, yeah. And it is truly mind blowing. Yeah. You know, what what um, exceptional artists they were. Right, but we're 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 gradually drawing towards the end of our hour. It goes in quickly, doesn't it? Yes, indeed. It um, does. So, th th listen. If people are interested in in your books, um, wh which for for me th th they just sound fascinating, where where can they find them? Well, my books are published on Amazon. Right. And uh, you just key in my name, Roy Steddle Humphreys. That's uh, that's uh, Steddle hyphen Humphreys, and um, my 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 page will come up. Yeah, and we'll we'll pull together a little podcast from this, Roy, and I'll put the links uh, in into Amazon f for for your books. Um, do you have any ongoing projects? Well, my on ongoing project at the moment is my fourth novel in the Belém series. Okay, the final, the final settlement. Well, that's the uh, that's the title at the moment. Right, but I've. I've, um, I'm still researching and I'm still writing at the moment. Right. But at the main, but also at the same time, I'm doing illustrations for my wife's book, the right. children's book. And um, so, and do, want, do, do you two ever do you two ever talk to each other? <laughs> so I got two hats, you see. <laughs> Roy, um, th listen, it, it's been an absolute pleasure to um, to, to have you on the show today. Uh, and uh, we will be putting links um, up for, for, for your book because they, they really sound, this combination of real history and, cool. and the, the, you know, the, the, the kind of fiction that goes along with real history, I, I, I think is wonderful. Thank you so much for, for joining me today, Roy. And thank you, Bill. Um, I mean, I, I, the trouble is when I was at school, history didn't mean much to me. It didn't. It was just dates. Yeah. But uh, but, uh, but I try to bring these character history alive. I put. I try to put flesh on the dry bones of this yes. history. Yeah. And it come alive. Indeed, and and the older we get, the more we feel connected to history, Roy. <laughs> 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 yes indeed yeah. okay well thank you so much to those of you who have been listening in today I, I found this very interesting these are subjects that really um, kind of capture my attention I'm really grateful to Roy for joining us today um, as it's a sunny day I'm going to be heading off now to the first beach party of the year down in uh, La Cala de Mijas I wish you all a very good weekend Thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week at one o'clock. Take care, everyone.